Ultimate's been in the line business for an awfully long time. We actually launched the Ultimate brand about nearly 20 years ago and the focus of Ultima has always been on quality, developing the best products that we can for each section of the market. Um, and we cater for the shore angler, the, the uh, boat angler. Uh, we're now coming in with new products as well in, in braids and so on. And uh, we, we are really the, the most specialized line company in Europe at the moment and uh, constantly innovating with new products for the future. You know, we've, we've got some of the best anglers in the world here today. I mean, this sort of test day um, is really important. We listen to these guys. They've fished all around the world for all the different species that you can imagine. Um, you know, Pete Corker, world silver medalist, George, England international, uh, Joe Arch, um, world champion. You know, they, these guys are the best in their field. I've been working with Julian Shambrook for many years and Julian's now going to give you a bit of a background on all the anglers who are here because uh, he knows them all intimately and he knows their achievements and, and their, uh, their strengths and uh, he'll give you a little bit of background on, to, on what a really great group that we've got here. I'm here with the Ultima Lads to take you around the North Wales Peninsula to catch some fish on lots of different venues. Whilst we're there, we're going to show you what bait to use, what rigs to use and how to tie them. We'll also show you the best knots for the job in hand. Joe Arch, Team Wales, probably one of Wales' most successful match anglers. He's pretty well travelled, Joe. He travels up and down the UK fishing matches week in, week out. He's been successful both in this country and abroad, at home level and world championships. He's been a world champion and a runner-up. The thing I love about shore fishing in the UK is the variety of species you catch, whether it's in the winter, the spring, autumn, or you know, in the summer. It's every, every season you fish for something different and you've always got a vast variety of fish to catch. The scenery and everything and where you are and where we're fishing today up in North Wales on the Chalim Peninsula, you know, it's an absolutely fantastic spot. Pete Corker, what more can I say about him? He is a Pensy League winner, he's a world silver individualist and has been a team gold winner for Wales. I'd say UK shore angling, I'm very, I like the variety of species. Uh, we've got a lot of species sort of off these rock marks are absolutely tremendous. Um, but the clean beaches even, if you're fishing light lines, you've got the mullet, you've got all the flounders and all the bits and pieces. So it's a variety of fishing I would say, it's just, it's incredible. Um, no end of miles of coastline you can explore as well, you know, it's sort of fantastic. George Smith, England International, won home international golds, silvers, bronzes. He also, unfortunately, has seemed to be the bridesmaid in the Masters. He has been the runner-up three times. My fishing career started when I was about five years old. Um, as a young kid, fishing in rock pools for eels, flounders, finding rocks. I progressed as we moved um, onto into Dover on the Kent coast, onto the Admiralty Pier, where my match fishing come in to its own then, um, learning how to fish for mullet, how to fish for garfish, how to fish for mackerel, all the fish what are there to catch, pouting, everything. Um, if I had the last chance of pleasure fishing, it would be Anglesey. You've got an island where you can catch anything. You put a bait on and you do not know what you're going to catch. You get anything from a, a humble dogfish, to a bullos, to a ray, to anything. You know, you get swims past and you'll, you'll catch it. Um, a very good place to fish. Shane Russell, Team Wales. He has won both the Penn Final and the Penn League. And he is known as the Baitman. The, the most enjoyable fishing that I think I could do is pu purely match fishing, but from a match fishing point of view, uh, dogfish, whiting, codling at range, that kind of fishing I enjoy. And I like to fish for those species in the match situation.
So then, George, basically our fishing makes about three things, isn't it? What we want to catch, where we want to fish, and how we want to fish. Yeah. But at the end of the day, we've got to look at the location, first of all, and make sure where we're going, we'll be able to find and catch the fish we need. That's it. It's, it's, where you live in the country determines what you're going to catch in that area. So yeah. you pick your location where you're happy to fish with. Yeah. Sandy beach, a rocky mark, mud, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And then, obviously, those areas, each area, is, you're going to catch different certain types of species. So, for instance, here where we're, we're sat on a rock, we're, we're basically looking for rock species such as wrasse, Dogfish, bullos, odd rays, congas, and big pollock. fish. <laughs> and the odd pollock, yeah, yeah, yeah. But the bigger fish, it's, I know rocks seem to throw up the bigger fish, but it's not all, in all areas it does that. The thing with coming to a place like this is there's no way on earth, you and I, I'm from Devon, you're from the east coast, there's no way on earth we could just turn up here and go fishing no. because we wouldn't know where to go. No. So no. But doing that, who, what, what you, you, do we need to look at? You need to be looking at, if you know someone in the area who fishes it regular, have yeah. a word with him, or the best thing to do is have a word with a local tackle shop. Yeah. He'll give you the information you need, the tides, when it fishes best, um, what state are the tides, even. Yeah. Um, your baits, some sand hill, mackerel, ragworms, things like that, and rock marks, that's the main baits. On sandy beaches, it could be worm, it could be crab. It's, have a word with a tackle dealer first, yeah. and he will put you right, and he might have the bait what you need as well. One thing as well I think is really important is uh, the weather, the wind and the tides, as we were saying about the location. So, for instance, if this had been blowing a five to six It'd have south, been southwesterly, it would have been, first and foremost, not safe. It wouldn't be very nice at all, no. no. No, you'd had swell everywhere, the rocks would have been very slippery. Um, you've got, your mobile phone's no good here. Yeah. You're, you're out of the way. Me personally, I think if you was coming, you have to let someone know that you are where you're going to be and what time you're going to be back. Yeah. Um, some of these areas here, you know, you, you, no one's ever going to know unless there's two of you. Yeah. If you're on your own, I wouldn't even think about going on your own in these places. And, and, and venues like this, when we're looking at these rocks, they might well look, put your foot down and you could be away because it could be slippy. Doesn't That's it. look, yeah. you know, wet rock can be very slippy. It can, yeah. It's, and the weed, the weed is one of the worst things. You get green weed and it's very, very slippery. You know, in the summer, it grows everywhere. And if you're fishing at low tide, you're amongst the weed as well. That's yeah. the thing. High tide is not a bad. You're on rocks that have been exposed to, you know, to the weather and that lot, and they're a bit more hardy. The ones that are down what, underneath the tide line yeah. are very slippery. So if we we're going to go and fish some of uh, the other locations we're going to do, one of the, another way we could do is possibly look at people that belong to local clubs, yes. get involved with the local clubs. Yeah, if you're, if you're looking at um, getting to know more venues in your local area, join a club. Yeah. They, they usually fish, they fish on one place all the time. They, they switch around. You get to get a bit of knowledge then of yeah. your local area. Not only that, you get to pick the brains of the better yeah. anglers who will tell you things, uh, what baits to use, what time a year certain fish come through, your codlins, your whitings, your place, your flounders, yeah, yeah. all things like that. As a, as a local re as a retailer in your area, George, it's, in, it's important that you keep in touch with those clubs and all the anglers and all the people, you have all the best knowledge, you make sure everyone tells you where the fish are so that you can then pass on that information and that's key to you as a, as, as a retailer, not only giving information but also receiving, receiving it. it. Yeah. I, I'm actually a member of clubs in my area um, and I get to fish on the club scene and I get to fish the match scene as well. Yeah. So it's I get to know both sort of thing. It's a good thing, but you get people, pleasure anglers who come in all the time, asking you, where can I catch some smooth elms? Where can I catch a cod? And straight away you can tell them, this is the bait you need, mate. This is where you want to be. And nine times out of ten they come back and thank you. They caught fish. Yeah. So it's, I know I've got a tackle shop. There's a lot of tackle shops in, in areas that can help you all the time. And a tackle dealer wants you to. Do well, yeah. Because if you do well, you'll go back again. Basically, we're pretty lucky. We've been blessed with glorious weather here. It's beautiful weather, sunshine. But we've come here on a neat tide. Now, a neat tide's a small tide. Small tide, yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, it's areas like this. Bigger the tides here. You know, spring tides, which are the larger tides. You'll have too much tide run here. You get pulled into all the snags, stuff like that. So, yeah, neat tides are better here. We've got nice weather. You, know, you've got to. Look at your weather before you go fishing. You, yeah. You've got to check it, especially where you're anywhere in the country fishes on different weather conditions and different size tides. Yeah. So go on, go on the Ultima page, I'm on the C section on ultimauk.com. You'll get everything you need to know from tides, weather, a whole lot. Excellent.
Okay, we got to the beach. We're about to start fishing. First of all, you need to set up your base camp. So, before you do anything, you need to have a look along the shoreline and you'll see the high tide mark. And at the moment, we're fishing an ebbing tide, which is a tide from the high water down to low water, which means you can set up on and around the high water mark. To do this, first of all, you need to put either your shelter or your igloo up. Take your bucket, grab the shelter, like so, out into the wind. When you open it into the wind, the wind basically picks it up, opens it out, you take the back bar, the brace bar. Now what you need to do is secure it. Now before you secure it, make sure that the back of your beach buddy or your shelter is facing into the wind. So now it's up, it's ready to go, securing it. Take your bucket inside. And then do the same on the other side. Won't go anywhere. Right, so everything's secure. Now all we need to do is get the gear inside. Right, now I've just cast out. The next thing I need to do, which is pretty important, is put the tripod in the right place. And there's a couple of key, key points that I, I'm gonna stress. When the wind is blowing from right to left, as it is today, hence why the shelter is like this, what you need to do is make sure that the tripod is facing in the same direction. You do not wanna do that. And face it upwards so that the wind catches the line and pulls the rod and the tripod over. A lot of people actually forget that. What you need to do is place the tripod like so. When we do that, the rod faces out to sea. The bow, which is the, basically the slack part of the line, bends around into the wind and holds itself in place with either the grip lead, or if you're fishing on a plane lead, as it drifts around. Bait's in the water, shelter's up, gear's inside, lovely day. So then, George, how long have you been using F1? Probably 10 years, more. Yeah. Um, brilliant line. It doesn't let you down. It's very supple, lays brilliant on your reels. If you're distance casting, excellent line, stretch it, brilliant. You know, the best anglers in the country all use it. You've got world champions, you've got England, you've got the Scottish, you've got the Welsh, you've got the Irish as well. All international anglers do use it. They use it because it's a good line. It will not let them down. I think one of the good things with this line is we can, you can also uh, tie a really good bimney with, with this line. With yeah. both, with the black and the titanium. Yeah, there's no problem with it at all. I've used this titanium actually float fishing on small um, fixed ball reels and found that the lighter line is excellent. Yes. But on the on the multipliers, probably the, the 12 and the 15 are one of the best casting lines. Of course it is, yeah. Um, I use the 12 to 15 pound on me fixed balls, close in fishing for flounder fishing and that light in estuaries or uh, your 15s plus, you know, with multipliers on. Yeah, no problem with it at all. And obviously, I would presume, depending on uh, the amount of fishing you do, would determine how you're going to buy it. Of course it's available it is. in shops in all sizes. Of course it is, yeah. It is. I like to go fishing regular and use a lot of line. <laughs> Be better off with a half kilo as you find when you're filling your reels up with the four ounce spools you always have a little bit left yeah it's nice to buy half kilo and just have a little bit left yeah one little bit it saves your money in the long run yeah
flying rods and reels. First of all, you've got to know what you want to go and catch, what you want to be using, the reels, the rods. First thing you do, straight into your local tackle shop. Being a tackle dealer, George, somebody walks in and says to you, right, I'm going out on the beach, I need a rod and reel kit. Help me, what should I, what should I have? The fixed ball is the easiest reel to start with. There's no forming it down, right, like you just hold it in your finger and let it go. Yeah. And it just, the line comes off the top, nice and easy. With the multiplier, you've got to adjust the brakes, adjust the bearings and all different bits of bobs. Yeah. It's, uh, it's like a winch. Yeah. It's got to work right. Yeah. And because of the, the fixed ball and the new perfect uh, cone systems that they have now, obviously you can use lighter lines. Yeah, the, the, the new cone spools now can put that little bit more distance what you need. Yeah. So your lines, instead of bulking out all the time, you can put what you need on, two or three hundred yards of line, easy. In the old days, the, you, it was always shunned upon to use a fixed ball, wasn't it? Of course it was. Never <laughs> use a fixed ball, never use a fixed ball, but I think we probably find that we've, uh, we use it at least 40, 50% of the time now? Of course you do, yes. Yeah, the fixed balls in the old days were the main reel. Yeah. As, as we got into that 90s, they were just shunned on then. Yeah. Know, the multipliers were the main thing then. But now, people are turning back to them. They're more advanced now. It's, they're excellent reels now, yeah. yes. Okay, I'm gonna show you how to do a standard off the ground cast using a fixed ball reel. Okay, an off the ground cast. First of all, what you need to do is have a, in your mind, have a picture of a clock. First thing, the lead. The lead we place at three o'clock. Move across. By doing this, we then point the rod tip to the center of the clock. So the line or the leader is then straight. Which means as you move, the first thing that bends is that tip. So you're going to get straight into the tip. As you get into the tip, the rod starts to bend and you push with your right arm. That then enables the rod to compress as you come through and stop looking straight up at the sky. Never bring the rod tip down and thrash. It's one movement straight through, up and out. Finger onto, onto leader, turn the bell arm over, make sure the rod tip is down, hand onto bottom of butt, come slowly through the cast and forward. Simple. No effort, hardly any strain, very, very easy cast. So, ultimate distance. Well, it's pretty obvious what this has been designed for, wouldn't you say, George? It is. What it says, the name, distance. Um, it's the casting lads have taken this over. Um, it's a very good line. It gives what it says. It's a distance line for casting. Fantastic on small multipliers, little fixed balls. I think they do it from an eight to a 30 pound. That's so. it. Yeah, it's a fishing, fishing or casting line. It lays brilliantly on reels, you know, on a multiplier and a fixed ball. It's, as, it, as it says, it's very supple, so it will bed in brilliantly. Um, I mean, I've used this a couple of times on the beach, but it's been taken over now by the casters. They, they love it. They, they swear by it. They reckon it puts an extra few yards they need. It's, that, that's what they want. And the other thing is, obviously, being a yellow line is key for when they're on the tournament field. It's now been endorsed by the UKSF. They're yeah. the casting organisation in this country. Yeah, it's, it, it's not just in this country, in other countries as well. They've all taken it on board. They love the line. It says available in fillers all the way up to half kilo spools. So the lads who go on a field and use a bit of line, it's ideal for them. The most important thing for the tournament caster is that the line is of the right diameter. So they need a 0.25, a 0.28, a 0.31 and a 0.35 to go with their leads, which are 100 grams, 125, 150, and 175 grams. Yeah, well, so these lines are to the 
specifications of the tournament casters organizations around the world so they've got to be spot on and that is why all the organizations have endorsed these products of course it is of course it is yes Turn chain bait, probably the yes. most important thing about our fishing to catch the fish. Well it is, without bait you can't catch a fish, simple as that. I mean you can catch fish on lures, you can catch fish on plugs, things like that. But ideally in most situations you need bait and you need good bait. And you need to know how to prepare and look after that bait. So the most important things obviously is looking after your bait but actually before you even get onto the beach. Yeah that's correct at home, yeah. At you home. need the right setup to look after your bait and to store it correctly and also to take it to the beach. Yeah. You need the right things, especially in the summer. Buying your bait, obviously, you need to get it from the shop and then into your fridge at home. Yes, your fridge, your freezer, you know, whether you're buying frozen bait, fresh bait, it's very important to buy good quality bait and to keep it in the right condition. Yeah. All the way to being put on your hook. So once, once we've had, once we've got the bait from home, yes. we're about to leave, what do we do? Right, OK. Well, obviously, you've got the right storage facilities, hopefully, at home, i.e. fridge, freezers, that's sorted, that end. Yeah. Right, you need to carry the bait in the correct places to the, to the best way of getting it to the beach, yeah. which can involve using the flask for the sand eels, the cool packs, which obviously fit into the cool bags, yeah. and the ice blocks also go in with the cool box. Those are really, really important. They're very Pe important. People just forget that just taking a cool box onto the onto the beach without any ice packs in actually has a complete opposite it has effect. an opposite effect because they uh, obviously they cook from the inside out yeah. yes you need to bring it down using these things which are frozen so if we were using uh, if we're going to say for instance uh, freeze or take sorry frozen uh, mackerel and sand eels with us what would we do would we would we just put them straight out of the freezer into a box or do we wrap them in anything? Well, that's quite interesting. The, the, the favourite for the, the sand eel, if we start with the sand eel, yeah. the favourite to transport the sand eel is the flask. Yeah. It's the wide mouth flask, steel flask, which you could quite easily get enough sand eels for a match in, i.e. four or five packs, and that is totally airtight, totally keeps the bait in tip-top condition. You could take a bait out individually as the sand eels come out individual out the flask, at each cast, you can bait up with a 70 part frozen sand eel, Perfect. which in itself is a good plus because a part frozen sand eel, when it hits the water, will pull out the juices far quicker so, as it breaks down. So what you're saying is when, when you're at home, you, you actually take the sand eels, cut the packet, take the sand eels out of the packet yes. and put them straight into the, yes. the thermos flask. that's correct, yes. And then transport the thermos flask to the beach to your fishing situation. Moving from the sand eels onto the mackerel, obviously that's a much, much bigger product. You yes, can't, can't stick that into a